All right. Good morning, agents. This is Kevin Lauren. I'm the director of training and marketing for Alta Realty Group. And today we're going to be discussing the NAR uh, situation. Um, we're going to have a little change of plans. Let me bring Bill Seitz, our corporate broker, on the line with us. Good morning, Bill. Bill, how are you today? Hey, Bull, Bull is good. No. <laughs> <That was fun. laughs> I can speak. I swear. You know, it's funny because I even I will say my name uh, wrong sometimes. People, Bull, Bill, you know, Phil, it happens. Fred. You know? Good morning, Fred. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Doing great. Yeah. So tell us, right. uh, we have a little switch, little change of plan today. Uh, you came across something cool. So bring us up to speed, Bill. Uh, yeah. If, you know, we'll, we'll get into a quick mortgage update. But what we're going to do today is, as I was preparing for this webinar, um, originally we were going to have Lauren come on and walk us through, um, and we had done this, uh, maybe a month or so ago about the buyer broker agreement and how to utilize it and, um, properly get familiar with it. Um, we, st we're still going to do that, but in preparation for that, we are, I was, um, kind of getting myself current on the state of the settlement, what's happening, what the expectations are going to be and what's gonna, the fallout or the, the results of it are going to be. And um, we're going to queue up a, you know, a 25 minute video um, with CEO of CRMLS, Art Carter and their uh, general counsel for CRMLS, Ed Zorn. And they do a really, really good thorough job of <clears throat> giving us, a, you know, this was published just a couple of days ago. So this is the most up-to-date um, information. And they're really addressing too the misinformation that's out there about what's in the media, what's being pushed out um, across the industry. Um, and so I think it's really good to start there. So we're all on the same page. And then what we'll do is we'll we'll go through the takeaways from this, um, this update and what's happening. And then we will um, set the table for a subsequent um, training on these forms, how to use them and getting prepared for what's inevitably coming down the road. For sure. So I think that's a great way to approach this. Um, so Bill, before we get into today's presentation, we're going to bring Debbie Sacconi from Clearview Mortgage on the line, and she's going to give us a little mortgage update. Good morning, Debbie. How are you today? I am fantastic. I hope you guys are too. We're doing it sounds great. Like, well, what's my name today? I, I know. I, I even pronounced your name. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you could be Debu today, all right? <clears throat> okay, that sounds good. <laughs> Oh my God. Uh, no, Debbie does loans. Okay. Anyway. Debbie does loans. There you um, go. <laughs> so Here's your website. I, I just <laughs> wanted, <laughs> I just wanted to give a quick little um, bit of information on interest rates because, you know, the feds, um, the feds made an announcement that they were going to uh, basically uh, have three interest rate reductions. Um, so what this is exactly, uh, it's, you know, they stated that they're going to, you know, rates are expected to drop this year, but when the feds announce that they're going to, um, you know, lower the, the fed rate, they're talking about the federal reserve and, they, you know, while they don't make the rates go up or down, they definitely have an impact on the rates. So there is an anticipation of, of, you know, a rate reduction, but you're talking about from now until, you know, you'll see a bigger difference probably by, by the end of the year, but they're even saying, look, don't wait till the end of the year. If you're, if you want to purchase a home, still people are saying, well, you know, I'm going to wait till the rates go down. Well, there's a lot of things that could happen once the rates do uh, go down. And of course, uh, you know, being in this business so long uh, as I have, people always think as rates are coming down, oh, well, I'm going to, I'm going to wait till they come down a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Meanwhile, what's happening is they're going to be, and they're going to end up paying way more for the home. All right. But just in the past, um, I would say week, I've seen, I, I've noticed in pricing some loans that rates have come down. So 30 year fixed conforming interest rates uh, are like 
you know, inching below 7%. So you can get a, a an, an interest rate below 7% and um, for no origination points. And of course, you always have that option of buying the rate down permanently <clears throat> uh, for one point even. You know, you could buy the buy the interest rate down almost a half a percent for one point. Um, and what else did I I priced? Uh, a, oh, a jumbo loan. Jumbo rates are like six and three quarters. I couldn't even believe it. So, and it does depend on the credit score and the down payment. So definitely you're not going to get a 6.75% interest rate putting 5 or 10% down, or excuse me, 10.1% down on the jumbo loan. Um, you know, you're, you're going to get the better rates if, if you put more down. But I was working with somebody that was putting, you know, 30% down. So the rate ended up being below 7% for no origination points. That's amazing. That's really amazing. So just one last thing to touch before I let you guys go and make a ton of money because the business is really coming in. <clears throat> make sure that your buyers are, you know, get completely ready and pre-qualified and I don't know about you but sometimes you know I I, well, I have to have the conversation with with a buyer but I you know ab about their debt and if they have any car payments and I will tell you you know if if somebody doesn't seem 100% ready right now just make sure they don't go and buy a car because I will tell you there's a an extreme high percentage of first time home buyers that just bought a car within six to 12 months from buying a home. It, it's like they go out and buy a car and it's so easy to buy a car. You don't even have to show a pay stub or tax returns or anything to buy a car. And so they think, oh, wow, that's so easy. Now I got my nice car. Now I want a house. And they think it's going to be that much easier. But now with that payment, in fact, I just pre-qualified one of my sons last night. And I'm like, didn't you just co-sign for your girlfriend? What's that payment on that truck? 700 bucks. I'm like, well, better get your name off of it because now you can't qualify. So, and and it's his first home. So it it's a little bit of an eye, eye opener. Make sure that your buyer's are well informed and and they they get pre-qualified and they know you know all the details of how to get in that that home so have fun doing what you're doing i'm actually tempted to hear the rest of the meeting bill because you know we have to look at purchase contracts too we have to read them we have to know what's going on with the transaction so I'm really curious to see what those changes are um, and, you know, how it even affects us. So I hope you guys have a great meeting. Thanks, yeah, Debbie. thanks, Debbie. Yeah, I encourage you to stay on, Debbie, just because this is an industry thing. This isn't just like, uh, you know, it will it will affect everybody in some capacity, uh, obviously the agents more than others. But just to finish up on uh, Debbie's mortgage update, um, I do agree with her saying that it's really important to um, express to your buyers, if you're working with some now, um, not to wait because they've done the statistics for every, like, I mean, and I'll, I'll, I can pull up the metric or find it, but it more or less goes like this. For every half a percent that mortgage rates fall, you add X millions of new buyers that now are able to qualify and able to get into the market. Well, we still have limited supply issues. And so we know this is all supply and demand and scarcity creates, um, you know, basically the, uh, the inflation of prices. So it's not going to get uh, the prices aren't going to go down if we have millions of new buyers that are able to now afford a property that want to get into homes. Um, it's better to get in now, like Debbie said, refinance six, 12 months down the road and beat the, um, you know, the basically the influx of additional buyers to a pool of properties that is only so big for the moment. So um, that's just uh, the part of the equation that needs to be uh, recognized. <clears throat> well said, Bill. All right. So yeah, let's cool. get, let's get started, Kev.
Let's get started. First of all, just make sure if you need to get a hold of Debbie, her information is on the screen and it's always on the replays that I send out. So if you need to get a hold of Debbie, don't hesitate. She's there for you guys. All right. So let me pull up our graphic here. And Bill, if you could just let me know once I fire this up that the sound is okay for everybody, that would be great. Yeah. Just, just make sure if you can make it full screen and, yeah. um, let's uh, it's like i said it's 25 26 minutes we will um, run through the takeaways after this is done these guys do a very good job of addressing i feel basically all components of this settlement and lawsuit and what what it means moving forward for all of us so uh let's um i will yeah go ahead if there's no sound just yell at me <laughs> okay, okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, obviously, since Ed and I posted our last video, uh, we got a enormous amount of views on that video and a ton of comments, a ton of questions. And I think that as we look through social media, we look through uh, some of the different channels that we have access to. Uh, Ed and I have both come away a little bit concerned with some of the misinformation that may be going on out there. And we just thought it might be a good idea for us to get in front of you again and give you an idea of what the settlement actually says instead of what people are saying uh, it says. Uh, we are going to uh, go through some of the, the key elements of that settlement and talk about you know, some of the, the different things that could be occurring over the next couple of months. Uh, one of the number one questions that we've gotten that I just want to say at the beginning, and I'll probably reiterate it when we go to the end, is that day to day, nothing changes for our brokers and our agents. Uh, until the settlement, and recognize that this is a proposed settlement, the judge in the, the Burnett case has not even given it preliminary approval at this point. So a lot of discussion about things that may be fluid, may change. Uh, we would I hope to have a better idea before the July timeframe that they've put into the agreement to have this occur. But just recognize that until then, there'll be no changes to the multiple listing service. There'll be no changes to the compensation field. And it should be business as usual for brokers and agents, with the exception of preparing for some things that you guys need to uh, have some ideas of what's going on. So I would like to dive into uh, what the settlement actually states. Ed and I are going to take some elements of the, the quick summary and go through what uh, is actually in the settlement. The first one that I think that may have some changes for you now, uh, because I do think you need to get uh, prepared and uh, be aware of buyer broker representation agreements, but part of the some, uh, proposed settlement is that there's going to be an MLS rule that agents working with a buyer must enter into a written agreement before the buyer tours any home, and it must have these specific terms. There must be a specific fee to be paid to the buyer's agents for their services. That fee must be ascertainable with no games, no uh, if, ands, or buts as to what that fee will be. And a buyer broker may not receive more compensation from any source that exceeds the amount or rate that is in, agree in the agreement with the buyer. Yeah, um, thanks, Art. Uh, the next aspect of the settlement agreement that really applies to us here at the MLS also is that any existing MLS rule and any existing fields where we accommodate for this offer of compensation with regard to a blanket unilateral offer must be removed. So again, after there's finalization of these rules and some time frames have been established, uh, we will be removing some of those existing rules and those existing fields. There's also going to be a new MLS rule that prohibits the listing broker and sellers from making one, an offer of compensation on the MLS to buyer brokers. So you can't use the remarks field or some other element to offer compensation on the MLS or disclosing on the MLS a listing uh, broker compensation or total broker compensation. So the combined comp is not allowed. Ed, talk a little bit about what the MLS can require uh, on this new rule at, at number in section three. Yeah, so uh, what's what's absent from this requirement is the MLS can, just like we do today, ask the listing agent when he's reporting a closed sale, what was the actual amount of concessions 
that the seller provided to the buyer. And to the extent that those concessions may have included some kind of, of buyer broker fee, that could still be requested and identified within a closed MLS listing. In other words, that's factually what actually happened. I think the reason that that is allowed to remain is because it's going to impact value, right? This is important information for you to have as both the listing agents and representing buyers. So you, when you run a CMA, you know, hey, what property resulted in some type of seller concession versus which properties did not. And that may impact some of the decisions of your sellers and buyers and how they value properties. So I think this particular section, it's important to note what's not here um, and what we're still allowed to do, which is to ask at the closing, what was the actual amount of concession given from the seller to the buyer? And that will still be allowed. Okay. And it also talks about some of the things that the rules shall not prevent. What are some of those things, Ed? Yeah. Um, some things that we're not allowed to kind of make a rule of, you know, rules that we can't prevent from happening are offers of compensation off of the MLS, right? So again, this is, this is kind of consistent with the overall philosophy of MLS rules, right? We're here to regulate and to manage our broker cooperative within the multiple listing service. But you guys still have the freedom of contract outside the MLS. So any kind of deal that gets cut not involving the MLS at any level is still out there for the um, the brokers to engage in kind of whatever deal making off MLS that happens. Um, the other thing that's important to note here and a really critical exception is that we are not prevented in the MLS from having some kind of field that allows the seller to communicate a concession. Now, this is very different than a unilateral offer of compensation. What's allowed to happen is the communication of concessions that the seller says they're willing to do in the list price. As an example, at CRMLS, we noted in 2023 that almost 50% of our closed transactions had some level of concessions, meaning the seller paid for some level of the buyer fees. Now, if you guys remember 2023, um, you know, we had high interest rates. So we saw a lot of loan buy downs, right? Where the sellers helped the buyers get into the property. We saw a lot of sellers um, paying for title and escrow fees on behalf of the buyer, again, to encourage a buyer to come buy their property versus a different property. So the concept that the seller can still create an incentive directly to the buyer is completely allowed and permitted within the MLS because it's not a formal offer uh, or a contractual offer of compensation to the broker. So obviously in, in some of the comments and some of the things we've seen uh, on social media, just the idea of creating this element outside of the MLS where there's this aggregated um, mechanism to provide uh, offers of compensation. Uh, we're going to, there's some issues that will uh, be in the settlement agreement to stop some of that activity from happening because we're going to agree to not to create facilitator support, any non MLS mechanisms, including sending any listings to internet aggregator websites for listing broker or sellers to make offers of comps. But the MLS can provide data to a site unless the MLS knows that the data feeds are being used for the purpose of operating a platform for sharing comp, or the listing broker is displaying both data from the MLS and offers of comp only on that broker's specific listings. Unpack that one for me, Ed. Yeah, this one's a, a little little complicated in its wording, but, but here's the scenario that I think was anticipated or the concern as the parties were settling. And that was, you know, so we have this big rule that applies to all the MLS across the country uh, that we can't facilitate or have a field that offers compensation from broker to broker, right? But what would prevent one of these big data aggregators or the large portals that everybody goes to from basically just, you know, offering an opportunity for listing brokers to go into their listings and drop in an offer of compensation anyway? And so, in other words, you would have the same facility, the same issue out there, uh, just not in the MLS, right? And that really wouldn't be fair. The, the concept here is we're, we're limiting this opportunity on a grand scale. So this particular aspect of the settlement agreement is is a rule that 
on us that says we're not allowed to even send the listing data to a company or to a firm that is using the data in a way to, in essence, mimic what is prohibited in the MLS, right? Now, that being said, if you're an individual listing broker and you get a data feed from CMLS, of which there are 27,000 of you operating a website, nothing prevents you on your own listings only from having some kind of offer of compensation to whoever you want to help you know, bring a buyer. So here, I think this has got more to do art with the kind of the freedom of contracting again, that some of these rules have to still be, have guardrails on them, that parties still have the freedom to enter contracts. But what you're not allowed to do on your website as a broker is to have offers of compensation for listings that are not yours. If you do that by rule, we at CMLS are gonna be required to turn off your data feed. Right, so it would only be an offer of comp on your very own listings. Okay, very good. So those are the basic facts about what uh, we've seen out of the proposed settlement. Um, and I think uh, it may be a little bit different than what you guys are hearing out there. Uh, obviously, um, you know, to transition, uh, we're hearing a lot of common questions and misconceptions about uh, that settlement that we just read off for you guys. Uh, you know, one of the ones that first one we hear is how could NAR do this to us? Uh, and obviously, you know, not being uh, on the front lines and not being the ones that have been dealing with the plaintiffs, uh, there's just a wide variety of pressures and issues that NAR has been undergoing in all of these lawsuits. Uh, the Burnett Sitzer lawsuit and the loss in front of that jury trial. Uh, obviously had a lot to do that with that, but Ed, talk talk to me a little bit about a, a former as a former litigator. You know what what could have enticed NAR to do uh, and to go this direction. Uh, the first one is the facts and the law, right? Everyone gets kind of grandiose, and I think maybe we watch a little bit too much uh, TV drama on what lawyers can do, and there's this like misconception that whoever has the best lawyer wins. That's not how our system of justice was designed. That's not how it operates in reality, okay? You have to deal with the facts and the law as they exist. Uh, no matter what you want, th the truth is still supposed to be what happens. And so the reality is the industry system that's been in place for 30 years, 40 years, went to trial and this side lost. That's the reality of it, right? A jury looked at the facts, that looked and applied the law and determined that there were problems with this offer of compensation in the way that buyers don't have an op opportunity to negotiate their side of the transaction. And so that was the decision that was made. And so NAR is forced to deal with that reality that they tried the case and, it, and the concepts and the ideals lost. And so what do you do next? And so um, NAR shared with us a little bit about that uh, in some of their frequently asked questions they published. And that was, you know, come April with these post-trial motions that were there, if, if NAR was not gonna win those, realize Art, what was gonna happen next was, one, there was gonna be a very large judgment put against NAR. There was probably gonna be some kind of bond hearing that would have required NAR to post a, a bond in the hundreds of millions, if not even a billion dollars, for which they may not have been able to handle, which means NAR would have had to file bankruptcy. Now, the moment NAR files bankruptcy, guys, realize NAR cannot participate in resolving any of these claims against anybody. They can't contribute any money, and they can't help resolve anything about the rule. The other, the other danger art that I think NAR was facing come April was a motion from the plaintiffs to the judge in the Sister Brunette case requesting that an injunction be placed against NAR to change the rule. So guys realize in that environment, one single judge in the state of Missouri would have been then writing the rule that we were all gonna have to, to follow. And it would not have included any of the nuances of the five points art that we just articulated and went through. We talked a lot about, hey, here's some things we can do and some things we can't do, right? And, and the reason that a negotiated rule set is better for the overall marketplace 
is it it does keep alive a lot of the concepts of transparency. It helps agents with this mandatory buyer rep agreement uh, because we know a lot of times that's not done. And so if you have some agents doing it and others not, how do it, how do buyer agents get paid, right? There would be a lot of problems if we had uh, just a judge made rule. So I think those are probably the two biggest aspects of, you know, why did NAR, you know, decide to settle? Uh, look, they lost and they were really up against, you know, being able to not help the industry at all if they had to file bankruptcy. And so I think they pulled what was the most logical uh, position and strongest uh, deal they could get cut. People view this as a is a bad deal for real estate, but it could have been much worse, couldn't it? Have? Oh, it could have been a disaster, right? Imagine, guys, a rule that says 30 days from now, every MLS just has to pull the compensation field out. And that's it, nothing else, right? Think about the bedlam that would ensue. Think about, again, here in California, where most people don't get buyer rep agreements signed, how do you get paid, right? And with no requirement, you'd have some agents doing rep agreements, others that wouldn't. So it might be hard to get one signed, which means the question of whether you're gonna get paid at all, does it move the offers of compensation kind of into a the back door room, right? Where depending on how good of a friend you are with the listing agent di dictates whether you get a cut of that action or whether you get nothing, Rick, These were all the way our world would have looked like if NAR didn't try to resolve this. And let's not lose sight of the fact that the release that NAR got was for all of the local associations, obviously us as MLSs are protected because you know our, we're in a lawsuit right now. Um, and so we end up with protection. And NAR's release includes every single Realtor member, right? There is a group of about 95 brokerage firms that are not covered by the release. They did cover 1.6 million individual agents. Um, in getting this deal done, right? So it's not like that is insignificant, right? That's a, that's a major protection for those of us that are realtors and day to day, you know, practice real estate. And obviously, you know, if uh, this all of the cases had gone to its uh, you know final ending point, uh, and we would have lost, it could have it could have bankrupted most of the industry. So. Uh, I think there's some important things to to realize on that side there. We're hearing a lot of this is the end of real estate, uh, end of the road for real estate as we know it. Um, there's some truth in that, but, you know, recognize that there's some misleading articles out there as well. Um, real estate as we know it, which means an offer of compensation in the MLS, uh, will be coming to an end. Uh, but, you know, recognize that compensation is not currently required in the multiple listing service. Um, that zero is a number that was allowed per NAR uh, earlier last year. Um, you know, it is our belief, though, that real estate will thrive. And you guys are, you know, very, very good at adjusting the way that you do business. Ed, talk to me a little bit about what you think, uh, you know, some of your experiences on the commercial side. It's interesting when people say real estate is going to end as we know it. You know, my personal career with real estate included quite a bit of commercial so for me, I look at these changes and go, eh, we're just, I'm just going to get paid like I do on a commercial deal. Um, and by the way, when I, when I close a commercial deal, the closing statement on a commercial deal, if I laid it next to one of the deals on my closings on a residential deal, look exactly the same. And what I mean by that is the seller paid me as the buyer representative my fee. The difference between the two is when I do a commercial deal, my offer includes the seller paying the buyer agent fee, my fee. And it becomes a point of negotiation between the buyer and the seller against the list price and other terms. And so there might be a little bit of back and forth on how much of my fee the seller is going to cover. But I can tell you guys, 90, 95% of the time, the seller pays has paid 100% of my fee on the buyer side. That is the norm, even though there's absolutely no MLS, there's no offer of compensation, there's no unilateral contractual rights that I have as a buyer's agent when I bring a deal. And trust me, guys, today there will be thousands of closings that happen in the commercial world where there's no MLS, no offer of compensation, and the buyer just got buyer's agent just got paid by the seller. I think our the real focus here is going to be changing some forms, making sure you're properly educated. 
guys go out and get some some of your negotiating skills up to you know a high level. I, I think the other thing we're going to see here, Art, when you talk about changes in real estate, I had one person ask me, well, so hey, Ed, what's going to happen with buyer agent fees? What do you think that's going to look like? And I said, I don't know. You have to give me a lot more information. And what I'm going to need to know is how experienced is the buyer's agent? Realize one of the things that's going to happen now is me as a 30-year lawyer, 20-year realtor, I am going to be able to command a very different price for my services than somebody who's been a realtor for 20 days, right? And that's, guys, how it works in every other field. As a first-year associate lawyer, I did not make as much money per case I worked on as the named partner whose name was on the door, nor should I have, right? So there are some opportunities that are going to be in here, and that is going to also be a different. I think you're also going to see differences, whether you're in a, in a buyer's market versus a seller's market. That may also have a little bit more influence on the level of commission and rate of commissions. Um, that is going to be a little bit more tied to, you know, a capitalistic market-based approach than it maybe had been in the past. Yeah. The other thing you're hearing, Ed, is that buyer's agents are going to suffer the most. Um, and actually, buyer's agents are going to have the opportunity to explain their unique value and their proposition and, and to their buyers. And they're going to be given an opportunity to place a value on the buyer agent services. Uh, and those buyers are going to be able to accept the obligation to pay for those services. A lot more transparent, a lot more of a clear, you know, direction to the buyer as to, you know, who's actually paying for those services. Talk a little bit about that, Ed. Yeah, I think it's an important distinction. I, I think this is actually a, a, a great opportunity. You know, we've all been taught in real estate, you know, you, you become a buyer's agent to do the hard work, the, the go tour a bunch of properties, put in lots of different offers, just so that you can develop relationships so then you can become a listing agent, right? Where all you do is tap the sign in, enter into the MLS, and voila, I get six, seven offers above list price, right? That's everybody's goal. Um, realize, guys, now, think about this hot seller's market we were just in. Imagine the very best buyer's agent who, who can demonstrate that they get their first offers accepted on a very high level. Why can't that person charge a premium? Right. They're not stuck with whatever the listing agent and the seller thinks that buyer's agent should get. They can command a, a level and a brokerage fee that stacks up against their skills and their expertise. And so can you actually receive a premium as a buyer's agent? I think actually are in a hot seller's market. One of the things we might see in the future is a lowering of the list side. Right. Because now as a seller talks to a listing agent. The communication, the conversations about the services the listing agent is going to provide and the hours and energy going to be spent by the listing agent talking to the seller, it's not going to be confused or bound up in how much of this do we have to give to the buyer's agent, right? And so in a hot seller's market where it's not as challenging to sell a property. Is there some downward pressure on that side? I, I think you're going to see some of those kind of things uh, reshift a little bit. So I do not agree with these these analysts, you know, from Wall Street who've never walked through the house with a pro with a buyer before, who say, "Oh, the buyer's agency will just go away and no one will pay for those services." Trust me, buyers want representation. They want great representation, and they will pay for it. Yeah, and I think it's important to note that, you know, statistically, you know, everybody's looked at the, you know, insertion of the internet and, you know, buyers and, and sellers being, you know, more empowered to do a lot of this work themselves. But, you know, statistically, what we've seen is, is a significant rise in the amount of people that are using the services of both buyers and uh, seller agents. So, you know, that may be counterintuitive, but I think people recognize that, it's a very complex, uh, very complex uh, transaction, and one that they need to be, uh, you know, need to be represented through. And nobody will go into court and have an expectation that the lawyer that's representing the plaintiff is also going to represent them on the the defense side. So, you know, recognize that I think there's some very, you know, clear uh, understandings uh, from the consumer standpoint as well. Um, we're also getting if the proposed settlement is approved, when will the commission field be removed? Obviously, there's a lot of moving parts. We mentioned that in the last video. 
uh, there are rule changes, there are potential uh, lending law changes that have to be made, there are forms that have to be changed, forms that have to be created, uh, but recognize that we're going to do everything we possibly can to communicate with you guys as, as much as possible, uh, but for now, it's business as usual. There's not going to be any changes in, in the MLS and uh, no forms changes until the settlement is final. And as NAR is uh, noted to everyone, that could take months. And if the changes actually occur in July, I'd be surprised. Um, I don't tell, don't uh, quote me on saying that they won't happen in July, but there's a lot of moving pieces and a lot of things that uh, have to be addressed before uh, these changes can go into effect in the multiple listing service. So in closing, I just wanted to kind of reiterate to you guys that CRMLS has not been planning for this, but has been aware of the potential of these changes for a long time, uh, for at least three years. I'm a big believer that you've got to do contingency planning, and those contingency plans have to go from worst case scenario to best case scenario. And uh, we're pretty close to, to where we thought things were going to be, and we're prepared to act as far as what the changes that are finally approved in the settlement. Uh, I just would in, in recommend, recommend that everybody, you know, calm the, the, the temperature down a little bit. Um, let's look at how we can embrace the opportunities ahead. We're going to continue to help you and enrich your understanding of all the changes and what it means to you on a day-to-day -day basis. And I would highly recommend that you guys subscribe to our YouTube channel and be notified of new updates from CMLS because we're going to be pumping things out. And we understand that there's going to be a lot of need for education and a lot of uh, times to have an understanding of what all these changes will mean to your day-to-day -day business. And we're going to do everything we possibly can to just not just bring CMLS's voice to, to the table, but uh, all of those people that could help you understand uh, what all of these changes that will work their way through uh, all of the escrow channels and the lending channels will mean to you guys. So thank you guys. Uh, thank you, Ed, for taking the time to try to hopefully uh, make this a little bit clearer for everybody. Obviously, uh, we're making it as clear as we're uh, able to at this point. And I just really recommend that you guys stay tuned and pay attention to all of those different communications that are coming out from CRMLS from NAR and from the California Association of Realtors. Thank you, and we look forward to talking to you guys again. All right, that was awesome, Bill. Yeah, I uh, I think those guys did a very, very good job of um, running through it, summarizing it. Um, you know, there's a, a lot to unpack in that, um, you know, in that presentation, but like he said at the very beginning, this is a proposed settlement. Nothing is done. It's proposed. It hasn't been signed off by the judge. So there's a ton of things that have to happen before this becomes finalized and before things are completely, um, you know, set in stone on, on what's going to happen moving forward. But they did outline basically what is going to happen, right? So I'm just going to kind of run through that list right now. And I will, I'm going to kind of leave it at that for today because... Um, the good news is, is that day to day, nothing's changing for the moment. So you don't got to panic, freak out, um, you know, what's going to happen. Um, nothing's going to happen today, tomorrow, next week, or probably next month. Um, probably get more information. Like you said, it is fluid. Things are constantly changing. And that's my job is to stay on top of this, which I will, obviously, um, and keep bringing the updates to everybody and also putting out best practices for um, Alta agents in how we um can help protect your commissions and also help uh, obviously protect the brokerage and your guys' licenses and know how to navigate this environment. But a um, couple of takeaways, and I just kind of made took some notes, um, is that there's going to be a written require written agreements will be required when you're working with buyers. Well, to me, that doesn't sound like a bad thing, to be honest. Um, we've all been burned by buyers. Uh, <laughs> you know, like the old saying, buyers are liars. And so um, I think this process will probably um, get get you in with more serious buyers because a buyer that's going to sign a buyer broker agreement most likely is pretty serious and probably has gone the, through the pre-approval process or um, that is the goal. So I think, you know, written agreements are going to be a good thing. Um, you know, the compensation, I think he mentioned compensation will not be able to exceed 
what is in the buyer broker agreement. So um, if you negotiate, um, and he mentioned the sellers most likely will be paying 90 plus percent of the commissions. So that's a nice uh, relief there, right? You know, it's, you know, yes, you're going to have this buyer broker agreement. Yes, there's going to be a compensation rate in there that you're going to say that you, you know, that's what your um, services are worth and that's your negotiating point. But um, you're not going to be able to, once that's in place, uh, it's not going to be able to exceed that. Um, so that's a that's an interesting point. Um, you know, these so these industry norms are going to change. The forms are going to change, obviously. So you heard him say about car is going to have to basically make updates and changes to um, this. And I, I imagine the listing agreement is going to change as well. And so they have a huge heavy lift here um, to basically, you know, they're pulling the rug out. What's been going on for 30, 50 years in the industry as norms are now going to be different, you know, and you know, that I, I you know, more that I, basically familiarize myself with this i'm not as worried or as concerned as i was maybe a month or two ago and i think the really important takeaway is not to get overly uh, anxious about this um let it play out you know it is fluid um and you know people were panicking you know i, I you know remember and naturally i don't blame anybody for being concerned and of course i mean it's 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 Change is never easy, right? Change sometimes is uncomfortable, but there's also an opportunity there with change. And so I think that's kind of the, the outlook we need to take is there's an opportunity uh, with this change to do things uh, potentially better, more efficiently, and um, and we can you know rise to the occasion um, instead of going, oh, well, this is, you know, I don't wanna you know, learn a new thing or blah, blah, blah. Uh, you have to adapt in any profession. And if you're a true professional in this business, you will adapt and you will find a way to um, make it work. So, and we're here to help with that. Um, just a couple other things. Obviously the commission field will be removed from the MLS. That's a certainty. So that's one thing that will be out of there. And um, let's see what else I got here on my, um, I think, you know, he mentioned that you're, you know, learning your value as a buyer's agent, right? As he mentioned, as his, um, his example was, you know, he was a first year attorney. Um, there's no way that he would be able to warrant the same kind of compensation or service fee as a seasoned litigator or somebody that was a partner at the law firm, right? And so a lot of you are seasoned um, agents. You've been in the business for years and years. You guys know, um, what buyer representation means you know what you do for these clients and you know that will be um you will be able to set yourself apart from somebody that doesn't have that experience and doesn't know what they're doing because like he said you know a buyer not going to be represented by uh potentially the you know the listing side with and have basically um you know representation from somebody that's already uh you know obviously there is dual agency that does happen um, but i think for the most part People want to have their own representation. And so that's going to be uh, an opportunity for us seasoned agents to basically articulate what value we bring to the transaction and why are we worth what we want to get paid? You know, if it's, you know, 2% or 3% or whatever, um, you know, and at the end of the day, you're going to be able to help to negotiate that. And if you can articulate that, and I think there's some other things we can do. And I think we'll talk about this. I'm gonna look into this a little bit further, um, getting accredit accreditation about being a certified uh, buyer representative. While, you know, people, you know, we might go, oh, I don't wanna do that, but that cannot hurt in your designation of, of your, you know, your basically profile as a professional in this business you have that certification that might win somebody over. Wow. You know, this person, uh, you know, is a accredited buyer, blah, blah, blah. And I know that NAR is offering that uh, free to members now. That used to be like, I think $200 or $285, but um, they are offering that free. And I, I will share that when I can get the, the link, Kevin. Um, but all in all, I think those are kind of the, the, the main takeaways. Um, what we'll do is we'll come back on with Lauren uh, either next week or the following week, and we will we will walk back through 
the buyer broker agreement, how this should function. And I think it will, I think it's important for us to start moving in the direction, getting used to this. Um, so we're prepared when it finally is, you know, rolled out and you'll be ahead of the curve. Um, if we wait until July or we wait until August when this all kind of is anticipated to roll out and we're not already ahead of the curve, I think it's going to be a lot more disruptive and it will um, be a bigger challenge. So we want to stay ahead of this. We want to build in the best practices for the, for the brokerage and for you guys. And of course, we will stay up to speed with any changes that are um, coming out of the proposed settlement. But uh, the good news is we can go do our day-to-day -day activities and nothing's going to change today, tomorrow, or even next week. But we will keep um, uh, moving forward with this change to our industry. Perfect, Bill. Well, that was a great uh, synopsis uh, from the CRMLS, the guys, and um, appreciate your uh, insights as well. So, uh, agents, uh, thank you so much for joining us. This is a really important topic, of course, and we look forward to continuing the discussion in the next couple of weeks. Uh, with that, get out there, guys. Make it a great week. Make it a productive week. And we look forward to seeing you guys on the Wednesday webinar next week.